Thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction and uh, I thank the French Institute for its hospitality and uh, I thank Arcas Gallery for bringing this uh, wonderful Picasso exhibition to, uh, to Izmir. I think really we all should be very thankful that Arcas has opened this museum a few years ago and uh, enriched mightily the cultural life of Izmir. And uh, I was very excited when I uh, heard that the uh, Picasso exhibition was coming because Picasso is a great favorite of mine. And um, well, what, what I mainly uh, admire in him is his versatility and his playfulness. And uh, I was very happy to see that when I came into the exhibition, that actually his playfulness is one of the main themes of this exhibition, as is already represented by this photograph that you see, this life-size life photograph when you come in, where uh, Picasso is uh, mimicking a toreador during a bullfight. And uh, there's lots of other nice photographs in which he's always doing something uh, crazy. But, of course, you are expecting me to talk about his art, which I will do. And, um, well, part of the um, versatility that we will see is the quick succession of styles that he had. And, uh, well, and he had such a long time to, uh, you know, to change, because he was born in 1881, you know, together with Atatürk. And um, he died only in 1973, so he was more than 90 years old, and he remained active till the end of his life. And he started early also, so because he was a, the, the son of a drawing teacher in uh, Spain, in Malaga, where he was born. So he became, uh, quickly he became a pupil, uh, you know, a student of his father, that is why at uh, 16 years old, he was already able to paint something like this. You know, 16 years, you know, imagine this, what you have, must have studied to, you know, to reach this level, but, you know, and, and what kind of talent you must have. But, uh, yeah, so he, he learned to paint in a, yeah, a classical, realistic manner that was the fashion at the end of the 19th century. Or it was already even a little bit old-fashioned, you might say, because Impressionism was already there. And this is more a realistic painting. And, um, but what he said uh, later in life, of course, was when I was a child, I would draw like Raphael, but it's taken me an entire lifetime to learn to draw like a child. And, um, well, that is indeed uh, more or less the, uh, the development that we will see him make during this lecture. Now he, uh, 
after he spent his youth in Paris, he, uh, sorry, in, in Spain, he, he went to Paris because he knew that he wanted to be an artist. And you know, when you want to be in the middle of the art world, you go to Paris, at least in those days. And um, well, this while this this first painting is still, let's say, not recognizable as Picasso, you know, as anybody could have painted this. You no, know, it's very well done. It's sophisticated, but it hasn't got a personal style. But uh, already in 1901, he does something that uh, well that makes him recognizable as an artist. That's when his blue period begins. And blue is, well, it's, it is um, yeah, a period where he, as the name says, of course, uses mostly blue as a color, and also the atmosphere of his art is very sad, you know, symbolized by that blue color. Uh, that has to do with the suicide of his best friend, Casagemas, who was also an artist that fell in love with, uh, with a waitress uh, and that res uh, relationship did not work out and he was so sad about it that he shot himself. So that uh, causes a depression in Picasso's life that lasted for about uh, four years. And, uh, but also, yeah, he, he more or less, you could say, he, he took advantage of that depression by personalizing his style and thereby, uh, let's say, uh, taking a big risk because nobody, of course, wanted to buy these very depressive paintings. And um, let's say, whereas before, when he just came to Paris and still made, uh, let's say, realistic paintings, he could very well live of his, uh, of his work. But now that he started to make these depressed paintings, he had to suffer uh, hunger and the cold because he didn't have uh, money to pay for, uh, you know, to warm up his apartment and his studio, of course, where he spent a lot of, the, a lot of his time. Well, of course, uh, well, usually, actually, uh, most depressions come to an end, and that happens around 1904, 1905. He falls in love, and, uh, you know, it, it says the sun starts shining in his life again. And that's when his uh, pink or rose period begins, where you know it's still some of his most popular paintings they date from that period. And remember, he's only 23 years old here, and he's already you know uh, busy with his uh, third different style. And uh, of course, this is recognizable as Picasso, but still. Well, uh, you know, he's just one of the artists in Paris now. People start to get to know him. Um, but he, let's say, he is not a revolutionary yet. You know, this pink period, the, the, the paintings from this pink period are still rather, let's say, comparable to what, for instance, the Impressionist Henri de toulouse lautrec used to make. Uh, you know, in the in the of abstraction and the colors that he used. But then um, something, yeah, he has an encounter with somebody who will become very important in his life, and that is uh, Henri Matisse, his somewhat older colleague, who is, yeah, who will become his lifelong rival, actually. So he is the most uh, yeah, sophisticated painter in Paris at the time. And um, in 1905, he makes this uh, large painting, The Joy of Life, well, a kind of uh, image of paradise with very yeah, wild colors, you might say. Matisse was called uh, a fauve by the crit critics, and fauve is uh, the French word for a wild man or a wild beast because his colors actually have nothing to do with reality anymore. So he even goes past Impressionism here, and that's why we call him an Expressionist. So he chooses the colors as he feels them, not as he sees them. And uh, this painting is seen by Picasso in the house of the, the Stein family. The Steins are super rich 
Americans. They uh, inherited a great fortune. It's uh, Gertrude and her two brothers. I, I forgot the names of the brothers, but Gertrude is the most important anyway. And um, she, uh, Gertrude asks Picasso, who she immediately yells, yeah, she sees some paintings from him uh, from the pink period in an exhibition, and she is fascinated by him, and she asks him to, uh, to paint her portrait. And uh, well, she lives in a, in a yeah, of course, a beautiful apartment on the left bank, and uh, Picasso lives on the other side of town and, and has a very rundown uh, workshop in, a, in an old building that is, uh, you know, where the wind blows. But she comes there for days after each other to pose for him, uh, but he cannot, uh, he cannot catch her personality, so he's, he's wrestling with it every day. So she has to come many, many times more than was actually the plan. And he just cannot find a solution until he uh, goes to an exhibition of uh, classical or ancient Iberian sculpture. So Iberian is from, let's say, the, the Spanish and Portuguese region, where you have, you know, the, 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 the sculptures had a kind of yeah, stylized, abstracted forms with these very strong eyebrows and uh, almond-like uh, eyes. And he, let's say, he combines that with the facial features of, uh, of Gertrude Stein, and then he is found in this, that it's, yeah, this, this little primitivization of her face, he has found the solution of what he wants to say about her. Uh, only problem is that everybody agrees that the portrait absolutely doesn't look like her. And she also, you know, she, she says that to him, and uh, he answers very confidently, well, you will look like her in the end. <laughs> um, and indeed, you know, of course, now uh, everybody, when he thinks of Gertrude Stein, thinks of this face as Picasso painted it. So this is in the same year as um, Matisse made The Joy of Life, which was also bought by that same uh, Stein family. And um, so Picasso visits the Steins and meets Matisse there for the first time. And Matisse and uh, Gertrude Stein's brother start talking to Picasso about what a wonderful painting that is, the joy of life, and, and how, let's say, how it is, let's say, the, at the forefront of art, and that it is, you know, that nobody can come close to it, which, of course, um, irritates Picasso like nothing else. And um, when he goes home, or let's, let's say, in the, in the months after that, he starts. Yeah, he starts making something completely new, where we already saw the, 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 the core of it, the beginning of it, see, we already see in that approach to Gertrude Stein's face. Um, and uh, he, he locks himself, he locks himself up in his uh, studio for more than a year and starts this enormous canvas of uh, three by three meters and uh, in the end comes up with this. So it's uh, yeah, a representation of five naked women. And uh, well, everybody who saw that painting when it was finished hated it uh, because the, you know, the, the faces of those women, as you see, they are deformed. And uh, yes, yeah, something is also, something strange is happening with the space. So the perspective, as we, as people were used to, is gone, and the, yeah, the space has been broken up into pieces, and so have the forms of the of the bodies. For instance, if we see this woman here sitting, uh, it is impossible that she is looking, you know, that her face is looking completely the other way not even talking about uh, the way those faces look. Now, his first, let's say, primitivist uh, inspiration were, as I said, those uh, Iberian sculptures. But um, here, uh, in 1906, he went to an exhibition in Paris of African art, and the, uh, the masks that he saw there 
were a great revelation to him because of their, yeah, of their powerful forms, uh, their abstraction and also their deformations of the human face. So they, yeah, they, he, he has described what he, you know, what he experienced there and he said, well, our painting is not a representation of life, but it is, uh, let's say, a kind of screen that we build between us and reality. And that is basically what became clear to him from those masks. But of course, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, let's say, uh, that is where the, let's say, the, the new attitude towards the human face comes from, those African masks, although he never copies them, he always makes his own variations. But the way that he breaks up space was, you could say, uh, prepared by Cezanne, a painter, you know, an impressionist of the generation before him, who had died just in 1906, and this is one of his uh, works that Picasso knew. And it is clear that uh, Picasso is giving a citation of this painting, of this, you know, the posture of this woman on the right here is clearly copied by uh, Picasso there. So that's, the, yeah, the, um, and, and Cezanne had said in a letter once that uh, when I see a landscape, I don't see trees and, uh, and clouds and grass, I just see uh, cubes and, uh, and balls and uh, combs. So he started with that idea of breaking up space into geometric parts. But that is, of course, what Picasso then in his Demoiselle d'Avignon, as this canvas is called, is, um, yeah, he, he brings that to, to uh, another level, that um, vision of space. He finds a companion in that, uh, you know, in that, that, let's say, that search, searching for a new style, a new way to, uh, to represent space and forms, and that is Georges Braque, a French painter, who also is very much uh, inspired by the same Cézanne. On the, to the left here we see uh, Braque from 1908, and to the right uh, a painting by Cézanne again, that um, gives a landscape from the same region as uh, Georges Braque was painting. Lestac is where the village where Braque himself came from. And again, you can see that Braque also uh, is much more extreme in his uh, treatment of space as, uh, as Cézanne. And then, so they start working together and sharing a workshop. And that is when, uh, let's say, the, the birth of Cubism really takes place in the years 1908, 1909, 1910, and uh, this is the poet from 1910. And you can see that what he does is, well, th this is the representation of a human figure, but he takes, um, he shows that human figure from different sides at the same time, as it were, by breaking up the form, and so and he does the same with the space around him, so that um, every form and every uh, piece of the painting comes very close to the picture plane and you get, yeah, it's, he, he's not looking for depth or three-dimensionality in the, in the classical sense anymore. Everything stays very close to the canvas. So this is um, the work of, of Braque from the same period and you can see how close they are in style. I myself can say, if I see two pictures next to each other, I still cannot say whether which is Brack and which is Picasso. And um, well, it, it must have been a real magical time for them. And um, yeah, they had a lot of fun together, of course. Lots of uh, running jokes, kind of people who are working in an office together for years on end. Uh, here uh, we see Brack making a still life with a violin and a candlestick. The violin 
you can recognize that the candlestick must be this then. But even if you didn't know that, you know, you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize it. So they're actually coming rather close to abstraction in these years. Um, so it's usually portraits and still lives that they make in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this period. So, but that's actually to say that the subjects are not really important. It's the, the research into, let's say, how to paint them, that is what it's about. And uh, that's also why the colors are always very yeah, dull, actually. It's not about color, it's about purely about form. And this is one of the most well-known portraits from those times, Ambroise Vollard, an art dealer who helped Picasso when he was young, and, um, and also a collector and, and philosopher about art. And this, uh, yeah, you can see that his face is completely broken up in pieces as well. But funnily enough, everybody agreed that this portrait completely resembled the man that was portrayed here. Then, uh, in 1912, after you know, experimenting with what we call uh, analytical cubism, that was the you know, phase that I just showed you, uh, they start experimenting with a collage um, technique. So basically they invent the collage here. And this is one of the um, pictures that uh, Picasso made in this time. And he's actually yeah, this is the first example, you might say, of his playfulness, because he's really playing with us as viewers. Uh, there are, well, one of the most remarkable things about this painting is, of course, the frame, which is made of a real rope, that, as, uh, the, as you use it on a ship, for instance. So, you start to think that this uh, cane bottom of a chair is also real, but we, when we look closer, it's actually not a real bottom of a chair, but a photograph of that, that is just glued to the canvas, and over that photograph he has painted. Of course, when you see those brush strokes, the paint going over that, uh, these pieces of cane, you realize this is flat, so it cannot be real cane. So there's lots of, uh, yeah, he, he tries to, really make you see or look for a second time and that is actually yeah, the definition of art even you could say art forces you to look for a second time and uh, well it becomes a real movement you might say this cub uh, cubism and uh, one of the early people who uh, aligns himself with Braque and uh, Picasso is another Spaniard, Juan Gris, who, uh, who also uses this collage technique here in this painting of uh, 1914. So he has here a picture of sun blinds over which he has painted several things. And uh, they, they often yeah, stick pieces of newspapers on the painting, but also sometimes they only paint that and suggest that the newspaper is there. So there's that same game going on. That finally results around 1950 in what we call synthetic cubism, where it's not so much painting what you see and breaking it up in pieces and putting it back together again, as just taking different elements and putting them together into a cubist composition. And um, so this is one of the very attractive paintings he made this, uh, uh, in this period of a harlequin. The harlequin is one of the figures of the Commedia dell'arte, the uh, Italian theatre form, uh, which becomes one of his favorite uh, subjects throughout his career. Already, by the way, in his, in his uh, pink period, ten years before, he was already painting harlequins. But this is then a cubist version of that. Cubism, of course, opened lots of uh, possibilities. So it's not only in Paris that people start following Picasso, but also in Holland, for instance. Uh, Piet Mondrian uh, sees an exhibition of Cubist paintings in 1911 and is immediately fascinated by it and starts uh, 
well, imitating uh, the, the method that Black and Picasso had developed. But Mondrian, unlike Picasso, takes the final consequence out of that development and starts a few years later to paint really abstract paintings. So he, he leaves out, let's say, the uh, representation of things that remember us of daily life, of the things we see around us. So this is the kind of painting that he became famous for. He's still influential in all kinds of uh, forms of design. Another uh, artist who started following Picasso and Braque was the Russian Kazimir Malievich, who we see here painting a knife grinder. And uh, so you see that you know the stone wheel here and his hands that are repeated several times. So clearly a cubist painting, although it's much although he uses much more color than Picasso did or even Mondrian or Brac. But uh, you know he couldn't have painted this, of course, without the example of Picasso. But he also, like Mondrian, uh, takes the last step and develops a style that he calls suprematism. Uh, well, uh, again, just like Mondrian, a kind of geometric, abstract painting. But Picasso never, uh, yeah, he never took that last step. He thought about it and um, he came close to it, you know, because some of the Cubist paintings that he made is really, you know, you really cannot see what it is. But he always backed off at the last moment because he thought it was a dangerous, a dangerous step to take. Because if you have if you have a painting without a subject, yeah, what else is it than wallpaper? He thought, you know. And also, what I what I think myself is that in abstract uh, art, humor is not possible. And uh, as we will see, there is always or almost always humor in Picasso's paintings. And instead of taking that last step and, and, and going abstract, what Picasso does is this. So, in uh, about 1919, 1920, he starts suddenly painting in a style that reminds us of the 19th century and of even the Renaissance, even uh, the classical art of the Greeks and the Romans. Of course, there's, you know, you can see that it's a 20th century painting, but it has such clear references to classical art, and uh, the way that he paints these bodies is so, let's say, uh, so traditional that, uh, yeah, you know, everybody thought, you know, what's happening here? Because Picasso had become uh, a world celebrity in the meantime with his cubism, he had revolutionized art, and then, uh, and you know, he. He basically would have never had to worry about finances, finances in his life anymore. He was, he was just arrived. He could have just kept on making Cubist paintings for the rest of his life and he would be a revered artist. But that's not what he does. You know, he just goes traditional again. And this, well, his, his art dealer went crazy. You know, he was, you know, Picasso, what you're doing now? This is, uh, uh, you were just starting to sell well, and now you're doing this. And indeed, nobody, nobody understand it, understood this 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 uh, move. But apparently, this was something that Picasso needed, that he wanted to do, and that's why he did it. So, uh, what is so amazing about Picasso is his incredible self confidence. So he just knows that because you know I am Picasso, and because I want this, this is important. And there's a wonderful example of this period uh, in the exhibition in Arcas here, across the street. Uh, it's a drawn uh, portrait of Leon Baxt, another uh, art collector. And uh, yeah, here again, yeah, when you stand in front of the real thing uh, here in the, on the other side of the street, what uh, what is so amazing is the the enormous security of these lines. So this is, this is where you can see that if he wanted, indeed, he could draw like Raphael. 
and uh, also the, you know, the way this man is characterized, but also the way his clothes are drawn. You know, each line has a beauty of its own. And uh, after that period, he uh, well, I think we are in the sixth or seventh period of his uh, of his artis artisanship, and he. Uh, enters what we call his surrealist period. It is the time of surrealism at the end of the 20s and in the 30s with Salvador Dali, Max Ernst and people like that. And, uh, well, they are, you know, just like the paintings of Dali, are dreamlike images. But, you know, in a different way. They are, you, you would never uh, mistake uh, a surrealist painting by Picasso for a Dali, for they, have, they still uh, have the handwriting and the personality of Picasso in them. And again, there is, uh, from this period, a great painting from the uh, Musée Picasso in Paris uh, that was uh, graciously lent to the exhibition that we have here now, the Acrobat, that's one of the first paintings that you see when you enter the exhibition. It's a large thing, and you can see it here on the right, hanging on the walls of the Musée Picasso in Paris. So this is really, uh, you know, something that in Paris they also think uh, deserves a place on the wall. And what is, um, yeah, actually all the all the art that we see in the exhibition is lent to Arcas by the Musée Picasso, and that is kind of a guarantee for. Uh, having a good Picasso because uh, the let's say uh, the the collection of the Picasso Museum in Paris is based on uh, what Picasso kept with him all his life. So all these things that are in the Picasso Museum were somehow dear to Picasso himself. So that's you might say a kind of quality guarantee. And this acrobat is really yeah. Uh, it is a wonderful rendition of the feeling when you see an acrobat. Of course, it's impossible for a human body to be like this, but that's exactly, of course, the feeling that you often get when you have seen an acrobat doing things with his, with his body that you cannot believe. And actually, the whole uh, the whole exhibition has as a theme the spectacle. So it's about acrobats. It's about the theater. It's about the ballet and, uh, of course, the, uh, the bull fights that uh, Picasso was very fascinated by. And um, I said, you know, uh, Matisse and Picasso had become lifelong rivals after they met each other for the first time. And Picasso, every time he saw something new that was made by Matisse, immediately reacted to it. And uh, this is, uh, well, something that also brings a smile to my face when I see it. This beautiful, very soft uh, Odalisque by, uh, by Matisse that he made in 1927. And then, uh, you know, clearly uh, the point of departure for, for Picasso, especially when you look at that arm, for instance, how it goes around the head and the position of the legs, although you can't see really how many legs she has in Picasso. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it almost seems like he's making fun of Matisse, but that's not the case. You know, he's just making something that, that fits into, uh, into his own work. So, yeah, the, the, they kept in contact, so there was some friction in the beginning, and there was always some friction, but they were more friends than enemies, you could say. So, there's a modern word for that, have frenemies. That's what Matisse and Picasso remained throughout their lives. Now, I had mentioned already that one of his fascinations uh, among the spectacles, the greatest probably, was the bull fight. And this is uh, another uh, painting that is in the exhibition here. And uh, it is exciting for a few reasons. It, uh, it seems to uh, foresee already the Guernica, with this dying horse here, which uh, you know, which you can also uh, well, there's a variation of that you can say in the Guernica four years later. Um, 
But um, the subject here is the death of the Toreador, and we only realize that when we again when we read the title. So we can see that he is basically his head is crushed or his neck between the horse and the bull. But there's so much. It's a small painting, but there's so much going on. For instance, the the way that the horse. Is, is painted with the, the skin of the horse is done very quickly with broad brush strokes, almost abstract, whereas the face of the bull is done in a very traditional, very detailed way, which gives us an opportunity actually to identify with the bull more than with the toreador or with the horse. And the bull actually, you know, is the, the aggressor here, of course, the bull kills the toreador. But, you know, but, but he has a kind of sad look on his face. Because in the end, of course, the bull will always die. 99, or uh, 990 times out of a thousand, uh, the bull dies and the Toreador wins. Of course, the, you know, the, it's not an honest uh, or, or a fair fight ever. And, um, but the fascination with this, uh, with this sport uh, by Picasso is not only because of the violence and the spectacle, but also because apparently he identified himself with the figure of the bull in some way. So there's a lot of, a lot of that has been written, but he never said anything about it himself. But art must be in, in this kind of games that he played, so here's at the beach on the south of France, and he's made a mask of a bull, and he's wearing it. Uh, those, uh, you know, the, those beach parties in the time of Picasso must have been really something. So this is 1933, this painting, and as I said, it remains a fascination for him, even in the years of the war and leading up to the war. So the one on the right top here is uh, 1934. And then uh, in 1940, obviously, the Second World, World War starts and Picasso locks himself up in, uh, in his workshop in Paris. So, you know, the, the Germans also occupy France and he toys with the idea of leaving France and fleeing the Nazis, but in the end he decides to stay in Paris and just not go outside. And that's when he makes this, uh, this skull of a bull, which, uh, which really is full of the, the heaviness and the, the suffering, you might say, of the Second World War. But how, let's, say how, uh, let's say how easy the bull came to him is, for instance, seen in this still from a video. So once uh, a video, uh, yeah, a man with a camera entered his workshop and they made him a draw on a, on a glass plate several things, and one of the things that he draws is, of course, bull. And what happens in those war years is that by accident he makes one of his, uh, well, most classical works, because in a, on a morning he walks past a heap of rubbish, and what he sees there is the saddle of a chair and the handlebar, that's the chair, saddle of a bike and the handlebar of a bike. And suddenly he thinks, well, hey, that could be the head of a bull. Which, of course, is only possible if you're constantly occupied with bulls. And, but, and what, is, what is extra, extra nice is that he doesn't only think it, but he, he fishes them out of that stack of rubbish and actually uh, welds them together and presents it as a work of art. And it is really, well, if I could choose, if you would ask me what is your favorite Picasso, I would, I would certainly say this one. Because it's so simple and, and so, well, it's so bright, you know, it's just even the, the holes in the saddle here become the, the, the nose of the, uh, of the bull. And I was, you can imagine that I was delighted to see that this, very work is actually also on the exhibition. I was really, uh, well, I didn't cry, but I, you know, I was very happy. <laughs>
I, I won't lie to you, but uh, I was really very surprised that you know that that Paris would loan to us such an iconic work of, of the great Picasso. It was when I started studying art history in my first year in Holland. Uh, we learned art. Uh, uh, let's say our general introduction book was H. W. Johnson, uh, Jansen, the World History of Art. And in the introduction, there's one photograph, and that's of this work. And he says, well, uh, he, basically Jansen uh, uses it to define what art is. And art, he says, is something that is born with a leap of the imagination, a jump of the imagination. And that is what, you know, what this work is a perfect example of. And, uh, well, here I also didn't cry, but when I came to the Musée Picasso in Paris for the first time, I saw this uh, sculpture by Picasso, and this really made me burst out laughing. I laughed out loud in the museum because uh, it's already a very touching, uh, it's, it's about this big, and, uh, but it's already a very touching picture, that baboon with that young, uh, you know, holding it. But then when you come closer, you see that the head is actually made of a dinky toy, dinky toy of a Volkswagen Beetle. And at that moment, I realized that, you know, he was just, just like with his saddle and his handlebar, uh, he just saw his son playing with a dinky toy, and he thought, well, that's an interesting form, you know, that could be the, the top of the head of a monkey. Let's make a monkey. That is, uh, you know, that is, I think, what, what really typifies Picasso as an artist. In the same years, he also made this very touching sculpture of um, a girl jumping a rope, where he also used so-called objet trouvé, found objects, like this basket that he uses for the, the body of that girl, but then also to, yeah, to suspend that body in midair while it's jumping, uh, by using, of course, a very strong metal uh, thing for the rope, which he had made by an, by an iron uh, how do you call it, maker. But anyway, again, that is uh, a great idea. So that is also what, you know, uh, for Picasso, his creativity was not bound to, you know, to what he planned to do. You know, his, his uh, let's say, the lines from his head to his, head, to his hands were always open for, for new ideas. So when he moved to Valoris in, in the south of France, a place where there were lots of uh, potteries, he, he thought, well, you know, why don't I also make some pottery? And so he got at, a, at an exhibition of, of uh, terracottas in that region. He got to know uh, some of the best potters, and uh, they, you know, they invited him to come uh, work in their factories. And that's what he did. And so he made lots and lots of very uh, imaginative uh, pottery, where you see, you know, the, the, this old themes like the bull and the woman. Of course, this woman is a potter herself. You know, she carries a clay pot in her arm, and of course, the the the, the ear of that jug becomes the arm of the woman. And this uh, plate here that he painted very quickly is really, I think. Um, the proof that at the end of his life, in the 1950s, he had learned to draw like a child. Um, so those are examples of his playfulness, and uh, I just want you to, uh, uh, to finish this talk uh, to show you a few more uh, examples of playful arts that we can see here uh, at the exhibition. Uh, for instance, um, he made lots of costume designs, and this is one for a ballet that he that was uh, presented in London. He was in London at the time also with the ballet, and um, so for the different characters he made these costumes. So you see at these in these uh, drawings that he's really focusing on the costumes and the, the faces are empty, so he doesn't he doesn't give any uh, attention to the rest, only the costumes. And they were, as we can see in the big exhibition as well, they were actually made and, um, and performed in. 
but he also made a costume for a Toreador. And there he couldn't just help himself, but you know, he, he first designed the costume, but then uh, he started, you know, I imagine, he started imagining the Toreador himself and he really turned him into a personality with a big cigar in his hand and a, a very stern, uh, powerful face and he gives him a place to sit on and, uh, and the background. So uh, instead of costume design, this just becomes a completed painting. And um, yeah, that is, you know, for me that represents the, the enormous inner creative power that uh, within Picasso that always wasn't looking for a way out. And there's, uh, I'm ending this talk with a very modest 10 centimeter high little uh, thing that he, yeah, that has no second in his work. But apparently he just found a piece of linoleum in his workshop somewhere and uh, he cut uh, a harlequin out of it and, and painted it with, um, uh, let's say, with a brush, he, he painted it like it was an in my kind of figure or a kind of, um, yeah, something to hang on on a chain around your neck or something. It's, it's, it's you know, it's not, not bigger than this, but it is an expression of pure joy. And I think that is the reason why he kept it with him the rest of his life. And, um, yeah, well, actually, pure joy is also the feeling that you get when you visit the exhibition in the Arcas Museum. Thank you very much.